best podcast in Long Beach, California. This is Tacos and Workouts. What it is, what it is. Podcast. This is me, Little Hater, the best podcast in Long Beach. Check it out, Doug. I have a very special guest with me today, Doug. You know him as the world's most interesting man. Here he is, Doug. Mr. Gil Carrillo, Doug. <laughs> Tell him who you is. Tell him who you hey, is. Hey, here I am. I'm with uh, Junior. No, no, no. Uh-huh. My, my name is Little Hater, Doug. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> uh, hi there. I'm here with Little Hater today, and it's going to be an interesting afternoon. We're just going to see what goes on as we carry on a conversation between Little Hater and myself, Gil Carrillo. So check it out, Doug. The reason why I call him the most interesting man is because, uh, not because he drinks Dos Equis or anything like that. I don't know. I, I heard you drink wine, Doug. But the reason why I call him the most interesting man is because, check it out, Doug. Mm-hmm. This guy mm-hmm. right here, Doug. He, uh, he went to Vietnam when he was 17. And then after that, he came outside and he became a cop. And then he caught the Night Stalker. And then after that, he came out with George Lopez, dog, on, 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 on the podcast, man. Hey, hey, that's one interesting about the man. Tell him, t- t- tell him a little bit more about yourself. Well, I was fortunate enough. I owe everything to a cop back in the uh, city of Pico Rivera where a cop at the age 17 took me home to my family and told my parents, sign for me to get off the streets or he'll end up dead or in prison. So my parents, uh, they listened, they signed. At age 17, I went into the Army, ended up in a place called Vietnam. I had just turned 18. I was two months into the, my 18th birthday, and all of a sudden I'm in combat, and combat straightened me out, gave me a new outlook on life, a new appreciation for life. And so actually I came out of the Army, and I had three goals in mind. One, I wanted to become a cop because I wanted to give back what that cop gave to me, and that was my life. And number two, I wanted to go to college. At that time, I was young and naive, and I thought only rich white people went to college, but I wanted to go to college. I have six uh, sisters, and nobody in my family, not even primos, no cousin, nobody in my family had ever gone to college. I wanted to go to college. Uh, I knew I was mature enough to go to college because I sent for my transcripts, and I was embarrassed when I got them because I saw I obviously thought when I was a chavalo that D stood for damn good. <laughs> and uh, F was fabulous. And they let me into the junior college only because I was a Vietnam veteran. And my third goal at that time was to start dating my ex-girlfriend who wrote me a Dear John when I was in Vietnam. That's that letter that says, hey, sorry, you're over there. I'm over here. It ain't working out. Goodbye. It was nice knowing you. And my heart was broken. And so now I'm out of the Army, and now I want revenge. So I wanted to, my, my third goal was to hook her up, hook it up, get her eat out of the palm of my hand, and then break it off with her. I wanted to see her suffer like I did. I got out in June of 1970. By September 70, I had her eaten out of the palm of my hand. The day after Christmas, 1970, booyah, we got married. And uh, so two out of three went well. <laughs> Hey, I guess there's a little hater inside yeah, of you, there, too, There's huh? a little hater in me. <laughs> there's a little hater in, inside of everybody. Doug. So <laughs> we just uh, celebrated our 52nd wedding anniversary. We're still, uh, I, I remind her every once in a while, I'm still working on goal number three. Well, congratulations, and, Doug. Thanks, that, that's a beautiful yeah. story, Doug. Thank you. And then joined the sheriff's department uh, because of my upbringing and where I grew up at. I was a natural. I ended up working gang detail for them for for a while, started their first plainclothes gang unit out of one of the East LA station, which was the gang capital of the world at that time. And things went well, and then they started a, a unit in the Homicide Bureau, which was my dream. That's where I wanted to end up at, because they were the best of the best. They were creme de la creme. Everybody got out of the way. You know, They were the chingonas of the department, so that's what I wanted to do. And then they started, uh, they wanted a team of investigators to do nothing but gang investigations, murders. So they called me up. It was unheard of. Today, still today, it takes about 15 years, minimal, to get up to Sheriff's Homicide, and I was there in nine and a half years. They called me up to go up there. And I was the youngest guy in the Bureau for about the first seven years, and I just stood there, and I loved it. I mean, it, it, if you're doing something you love to do, it's not a job, brother. It's, it's, it's a lifestyle. And it was good to me. It was rewarding. Uh, but it, it's a tough, hard job, and it'll eat weight at you. And I ended up working this serial killer case, or 
Richard Ramirez Night Stalker case, which is just one of hundreds of cases that I worked and ended up retiring after 38 years and living the life. I uh, got contacted by a director and they wanted to do some thing. And next thing I know, we're doing a four part documentary for Netflix, which is out there today for your viewers or listeners. It's a good documentary. It's called Richard Ramirez, The Hunt for a Serial Killer, The Search for a Serial Killer. And I didn't want to have anything. I told the director, he told me, this is what I want the story to relate. And I said, I don't want to know what the story's going to relate. I'm the talking head. You're the director. This is your profession. And I don't want to see any rough cuts. You edit, do whatever you want. Whatever it is, that's what you let me know when it's going to air. Uh, they did. I watched it, uh, and when he called me up to tell me he was going to air, he just said, enjoy the ride. And I said, what do you mean enjoy the ride? He says, enjoy the ride. I'll talk to you later. And that was it. And uh, I watched it. I cried. I laughed. And then all of a sudden I started receiving communications from all around the world. I had no idea. Netflix went nuts because it's the first documentary they had that – rolled uh, number one, trending for a week and a half. It was number six around the world. And so it got a lot of attention. I started getting invitations to go speak all over the U.S., doing all kinds of television stuff. So it was, it was kind of nice, you know. And I after, we, after I watched it, the only thing I did was I had to apologize to my wife. I asked for forgiveness because during the case, it was clear her job was the house and the kids, and my job was catch the killer. And the one thing I never factored into all this stuff was fear. And she was scared to death, and I wasn't around. I was never around. The captain is telling the time we were working 16, 18 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, I didn't get to see her, the kids. Once in a while, I called her up and say, hey, how about meeting me here or meet me there? And it was kind of tough on a family life, but. It all came together and since that time. George Lopez, you mentioned George. I didn't realize George was a true fanatic crime. He's a true crime fanatic. And he watches all that stuff. And next thing I know, uh, an old friend of mine calls me up and says, Gil, George, I just heard on the radio, George Lopez saying, anybody know Gil Creel? Haven't given me a call. Here's the number. So I did. And that led to an invitation. He wanted me to go golfing, and I don't golf. I told him, I'll turn into the comedian. You'll be laughing your ass off at me. And he said, well, how about a beer? Will you come down and join us for a beer? I said, yeah, I can have a beer with you guys. So I went to the address he gave me, and it turned out to be a sound studio for ATC, All Things Comedy. And it was a podcast. I said, where do I sit? He said, right there in front of the mic. And there was no countdown, no slate. We're rolling, quiet on the set, nothing. You just sit there and bullshit. And so it was fun to do. There was another comedian on there. Bobby Lee from uh, Mad TV was on there. And it was a fun show. It was a fun thing to do. Drank beer. And just shot the breeze. And then he asked me to come back. And I said, well, I, I'm busy the next couple of weeks. I can't. I got stuff going. <clears throat> but I then went back. All together, we just finished our second year together. We did 97 shows. And I was on all but three of them with them. And. I heard him one day on the news calling me. He says, why is your, they're interviewing me. He said, why is your podcast so successful? He says, I bring on good guests and I have a co-host and Gil Creel can catch serial killer. He just can't control his own blood pressure. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's gone, it went well. And right now we're on a little vacation and we'll see what happens in the future. But it's been a great ride and things are going well. I can't complain. Hey, I'm glad you bring out George Lopez back because I, ha I, ha I have a, a question, Doc. Man, I like George Lopez back. You know, he, you know, recently some people were saying that that he he didn't know who a comedian was, and, and he got he got a lot of flack for that. And to me, I thought that was wrong what people were doing to George. I'm asking myself, what do, what do they want from this guy, Doc? He like make you laugh like all these years. And now you're turning up against him. Hey, people ask me all the time if I know who somebody is, and I'm and, and if I don't know him. It just means I don't know him, dog. And and, and, and I don't understand why, why so many people turned on him, dog. I don't think he did anything wrong, dog. 
I've uh, I was there the show that you're talking about. I I'm on the podcast with him, and the comedian that he spoke about. I remember his name is Ralph. I don't even remember his last name, and he started telling the comedian that was on our show, uh, Steve. Oh, maybe Steve Trevino. Trevino. Yeah, Trevino, Steve, yeah, Steve Trevino. And Steve kept bringing this guy's name up, and finally George said, "Why do you keep bringing his name up?" He says, well, he's a young Latino comedian. You know, we ought to do everything we can for all the young Latinos out there. And George says, no, you're on here. I'm promoting you. This is for you. Yeah. Not promoting. And that's where it went down. It went south from there. And George didn't think it was a good idea. And this guy thought it was. Well, next thing you know, social media is blowing up over the fact that George is not helping other Mexican comedians. And that's what he's there for. He forgot where he came from. And and I said immediately, I, I never would jump in on any of it uh, because all you do is give them more fuel for their fire. Yeah. So I just let it ride. They weren't saying anything about me. But the realities are, and I've said this to my family, what you have is you have a few people yeah. that got up there and said, this is what it is, and the bad mouth George. And that's pretty big and bold to do a man that's successful to go ahead and take him on for the reason you're taking him on. And then what you have are thousands of people that are sheep mm-hmm. that do nothing more than follow. They are, they get bravado. They become brave behind a computer screen that they're not going to have to confront anybody else. And they can say whatever they want to. You know what I call those people? Hypocrites. Doc. I, I did another podcast and I covered this topic and I told everybody, Hey, you guys, you guys are hypocrites. You know what? You're talking bad about George, and then when you see him out walking on the street, you're going to be the first ones to tell him, hey, George, I've been a fan all along. Sure. Let me take a picture with you. And at first, they're dogging him down, and then when they see him, they're going to want a picture with him. Sure. I, I will tell you uh, from the bottom of my heart, and the only thing I've got left in life at this point, time of my life, is my own integrity and my own word. I don't lie for anybody. I wouldn't lie for George. George is a good man, and George helps out an awful lot of people. George, you know, they say you don't have, you know, you don't help Latino comedians uh, on his prime time television show right now. He's got uh, Momo Rodriguez and Al Madrigal, two Latino stand up comedians, regulars on his show right now, and he brought them up. I've seen him put other comedians on stage. What he's done for me and my family is, I, I mean, I sat there and I had tears coming down my, down my cheek. I was in Vegas and my wife says, what's wrong with you? What, what, what's going on? I said, I don't know what I did to ever deserve this. You know, we were there in Vegas. I wanted to go, I told the wife, let's just get away and go see George in Vegas. So we went up there and he took care of me and my wife. He's taking care of my family. He, he's just. He's a good man, you know, and and they don't see that. The one thing he is, and he's got a smart mouth, is because he's a comedian. That's what comedians do. They're they're quick. They got razor sharp tongues. And he didn't get where he's at today because he wasn't any good. He's good. He's kind. uh, He's my friend. And I wish him nothing but the best. Uh, I'd do anything I could to support him or any, any cause he's got. He's got his own foundation for kids, for kidneys. You know, and some of these people that were writing stuff on the internet, they started not only attacking him, they started attacking his family. And it it was just, it was ugly. And I just, you know, and George is human. Now, I don't know if George reads all this stuff, but George's handlers, people that, they're the ones that are reading all this stuff. They got to be advising me something. And George did call up and apologize uh, to the guy. And, And I remember years ago, a comedian called me up. Jeff Garcia, I love the guy, you're a good comedian. And I was at a comedy show, and this guy ripped me a new ass. I was right in the front <laughs> row, just ripped me a new ass. And next morning, called me up, and he says, hey, I just want to know, I want you to, I want to apologize, I didn't realize we. He didn't know who you were? No. Uh, Jeff does that, and, like, he does that. <laughs> and, he, and, and he says, I'm so sorry. I said, no, don't apologize. I said, if you listen to your stuff, nobody was laughing louder than I was. 
you're a comedian. You're funny. You did it. It, was, it was a great show. But the comedian that was hosting it told him, hey, you know, you fucked up. Don't do that stuff. You know, <laughs> this is a good guy. And he did it. It wasn't. George called this guy Ralph up and apologized to him. He didn't want to offend him. That's not what it was intended for. And I've listened to Ralph on another podcast sit there and say, he didn't offend me. It wasn't wrong. All these other people jumped in. Yeah. And unnecessary. And so it is what it is. I hope George comes back. Uh, so we'll see what happens. So, so Jeff Garcia, I, I, I like his comedy. You know, at first I used to hate on, on Jeff Garcia. Right, because but but then I realized that that's the style of comedy. He goes after the crowd, sure. and he kind of makes fun of the crowd, and I get it, right? So that's just his style of comedy, right? Um, what George did is 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 like you know by apologizing to that guy that that's that that was good too, man. But you know what? It's like this, dog. Um, not not all comedians help each other out, dog. Not all podcasters help each other out. That's just the reality, dog. And, and and we're we're trying to do a business sometimes, you know. I'm trying to grow my comedies. This guy's trying to grow his podcast. Sometimes we can't help each other out, not because we don't want to. It's because it's because we can't. It's like I'm too busy trying to write my jokes. I'm too busy trying to line up my guests for for my podcast. Then I have to go audition for this TV show. I I, I can't help everybody out sometimes. And and you know what? Doug? It, it would be nice if it could happen, but sometimes it just doesn't. Doug. So it's nice being in a position like myself. I don't have a podcast. I don't do anything. I just go on as a guest and do whatever they want. It's much easier. And I think you were right. It was like it was like about two podcasters, maybe uh, uh, another podcaster that looked at an opportunity to 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 turn the people against them, and 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 like they said, they just jumped on them and they were talking bad about them. Dogs. He's still selling out stand up comedy shows, and he's got a prime time channel four on Friday nights. Lopez versus Lopez television show. He's doing good. He's, he's a good man. He's a man, Doc. He is. He's, he, a, he's, he's the living he, legend. And, he, and, he, and he's a good man. My family loves him. My wife, my kids, they all love him. And I love him. Hey, hey Doc, can I ask you a question? And I got that sissy to tell me he loved me, too. Oh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> you, guys, you guys work well together, Doc. Yeah. I see that carnalismo, brotherly love in you guys, Doc. Yes. Hey, 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 can I ask you a question? Sure. Do you like tacos? I love tacos. You had me at tacos, brother. <laughs> me and tacos were made for each other. What's the best way to eat a taco? <laughs> there is no better way. You put it in your hand and get it in your mouth. And if you drop any, use your fingers to pick it up. You don't use a fork or a spoon. From behind. From behind. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. <laughs> um, how many podcasters does it take to screw in a light bulb? I give. How many? Podcasters don't know how to screw in light bulbs. They just know how to screw each other. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Why, why, why don't Jeffrey Dahmer like chicken fingers? I give. Why? Because he prefers people fingers. Uh, <laughs> oh. Hey, that, that's what that's within your alley, Doug. Ah, <laughs> uh, Doug. All right, Doug. Look, it's been fun having you on the show. I got to take off, but my co-host is going to come, and he's going to finish the interview, Doug. Sounds good. I'll be here. Okay. Doc. I ain't going anywhere. We're going to take a short little break. We'll be right back. All right, Nicole, this is me, Little Hater. And guess what, Doug? This podcast is brought to you by the Patio Nuts. You had me at Ola. So go out and get some of these nuts. It's the Patio Nuts. <laughs> what it is, what it is. Podcast. All right, and here we are back again. Thank you, Little Hater, for the first part of the interview, and uh, we'll be filling in uh, for the rest of the interview. Um, Gil, nice to meet you. Nice to have you on, on the it's Tacos and Workouts it's, podcast. Uh, the pleasure is all mine. I'm glad you took over for Little Hater because he is a Little Hater. <laughs> he yeah, is. He's got a little <laughs> attitude going with him. <laughs> it's nothing but love, I'm sure. But listen, now that we have you on the show, I, I, I got you your very own Tacos and Workouts T-shirt. So everywhere you could, you go, you could just represent. I'm, I'm gonna I'm represent. I'm gonna put that thing on, and I'm gonna be. I'm gonna have a workout eating tacos. <laughs> Not only did, did did we bring you your very own tacos and workout, um, but I hope you like nuts because we also brought you some uh, tapatio nuts for you and George, as well as your your uh, you your spice you. there, so you guys could enjoy that. Thank so you. So the bags for you and George, and then uh, the t-shirts for you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. There you go. Okay. So um, 
have so many questions to ask. Uh, Shoot. <laughs> I think Little Hater said it best. You're the most interesting man in the world. And, um, and, and you're re- famous for catching Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. Well, it was my game. I, led, I was a co-lead investigator on the case. We got him. We prosecuted. It was actually, if you go back and look at it, it was actually the citizens that captured him after he tried carjacking a lady. The husband came out, hit him in the head, gave him a coscoron, and, and then the neighbors jumped in and just held him there until the cops got there and hooked him up. Yeah, they, I mean, uh, my people in East L.A., shout out to everybody in East L.A. I love you guys out there. You know, I'm from East L.A. myself. Um, you know, they, they definitely uh, helped capture him, but you know, they wouldn't have been able to do that without your detective work. Well, thank figuring you. Figuring out the shoe size, the Avia shoe, and all that great yeah. information. You know, keeping that inf- that vital information away from the press not to release that. It, it was a lot of hard work. It and was. Seeing that, that, that documentary... Man, certain things in that documentary, when, when that reporter was trying to give out that information for a scoop, I was like, lady, what are you doing, right? Um, she was, she, Laurel Erickson and I turned out to be good friends. We're still friends today. Uh, talking to Paul Skolnick, who was also in the uh, documentary, that was her producer at the time. He says, Gil, you know she never would have really given it up. Oh, really? Yeah, that's what he said. He said, she never would have really given it up. And I said, well, I'm glad she didn't. She's. At that time, in the heat of battle, I wanted to hook her up for extortion. But you know what? When I was watching it, I, I, I right before you even said, I go, "That's extortion," and yeah. then you said it, and I was like, "I was right." Yeah, so I wanted to hook her up, but Captain said no, and we didn't. And as it turned out, she turned out to be an asset, and she turned out to be a good friend. Well, listen, when when the Richard Ramirez case was going on, I was about five years old, right, in East LA. And by the time I figured, uh, heard ab- about Richard Ramirez to the time they caught him, it was like about two weeks, right? But during that time, like um, my mom, the vecinas, the neighbors, they were just talking about this crazy man who was, um, you know, uh, putting up a Satan, a Satanistic pentagrams, killing women, doing all these horrible things that he sneaked in through the window. And they said, and he's right here in East L.A. Did he actually commit any actual crimes in East L.A.? No. Okay. No, he he knew better than to go into any barrios. He was running at that time. That's how he ended up in East L.A. Okay. He got ID'd on a bus and then did running, jumping fences. He knew better than to go into the barrios. He didn't. Yeah, and then... Um, Not only that, they didn't have the property, that what he called the booty, you know, that the stuff he's stealing. They had better property in other neighborhoods oh, than they did in the barrio. Okay. Yeah, um, and then um, I remember that when when I heard about this, I was I was five years old, so I was like, okay, well, I'm not like I'm fine. I don't think he's gonna mess with me. And then here 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 later on, uh, I started to hear that yeah, that he was kidnapping children, and then and then 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 I was five and I was worried, right? And then uh, we started calling him El Cucuy, which is like the boogeyman, right? And That's it was like they used to call me out on the streets. As a cop, I was a I was the kukui, huh. and my partner was Green Eye. With the, the team was Green Eyes and the kukui. But why would they call you a kukui? Uh, I I got the nickname on a call one night. Uh, There's a rookie cop that had to go around a building and on a prowler call, and it was an apartment house. So he went around one side, and his partner stood back, and I went around the other side. So we'd meet, and I told my partner, his partner, I said, "Watch this," and I jumped in the bushes. And when he came walking around, I jumped out and I screamed and I grabbed his hands because I knew his hands, I knew he'd go for a gun. So I jumped up and screamed and he screamed and, and then we got the good laugh and he says, God damn, I thought the Kukui had jumped out after me, meaning the boogeyman. Yeah. And that name kind of stuck with me and the cops started calling me Kukui and pretty soon the gangsters heard him calling me Kukui. So everybody was calling me Kukui at the time. Wow, that's, that's a, 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 a... A crazy story. A lot, a lot. One thing that that um, a lot of people don't realize is that um, police officers, right, really enjoy comedy, right? They, Yo, they, it's it's nothing but laughs within the it's department. A relief. When they gotta work, they gotta work. But yes. when it's time to be serious, they like to crack jokes and be happy, man. Because you guys li- live one of the most um, stressful jobs in in the world because you're you're out there every day putting your life on the line. You don't know when something bad could happen. It, sure. it could happen in a traffic stop or it could happen while you're going out to save somebody or help, some, uh, help somebody in a domestic violence situation. 
Yeah. It's so just, thank you for for all your hard work and your dedication. You're and, very welcome. And and the things you did for Los Angeles. And uh, not only do I thank you, but I'm sure all of Los Angeles thanks well, you. Thank you. It, it, it's very rewarding today. It's very gratifying. It was a very gratifying job at the time. And you just don't think of all the negative stuff. You just constantly stay alert, try to stay alert, and try to be prepared to handle anything that comes your way. And when it's serious stuff, when it gets hot, then you just have to remember not to panic because if you panic, somebody gets hurt and you stay calm. So you're trained, and hopefully they give you sufficient training. And things are different today than they were when I was there. Everybody's got cameras with them now, and everybody wants to stand up and fight. It was a little easier, I think, for me at the time. Yeah, the times are not getting any easier now with 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 whatever's going on in this, these newer generations. But um, I wanted to, since we were talking a little bit about like um, children, right? So when they said that 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 um, that that uh, Richard Ramirez was kidnapping children until, and I, that's something I had forgotten about until I, I watched the the Night Stalker, and I was surprised to to find out how many I think it was what 13, 14 children that he kind of like. Kidnapped? No, we were only gonna. We had uh, probably five or six. Okay. Uh, and that was it. There was a couple of attempts that he didn't get to that we didn't count, but there were only five or six of them that we actually were gonna file against him. And we did file against him uh, for the kitty. We called them kitty counts. And then the one young female now, she's 42, 43 years old, uh, who was in the documentary. She was six years old at the time. She was a beautiful little kid, strong witness, good little girl. Uh, we went down her house to interview her. She was our best witness as a kid. And we went to interview her. And I remember her mom bringing her out into the living room and saying, sweetheart, remember these gentlemen? And she said yes. And then she jumped up on mommy's lap and whispered something in mommy's ear and started giggling, put her head down in embarrassment. And the mother said, she wants you to know she remembers you, pointing to me. She remembers you the best because you remind her of her teddy bear. And it was a macho-looking teddy bear I saw. It was all tatted down, buffed out. <laughs> he was cool. <laughs> and so uh, the deputy district attorney, Mr. Phil Halpin, asked the little girl, sweetheart, uh, you know, we're here today. We want to talk to you about it. Remember we went into that room and it was like a theater and there were six people up there? And do you remember that day? She says, yes, I remember that day. And I remember picking number two. And he says, number two, now we're, I'm, we're concerned. Is somebody coaching her? And he says, okay, well, you say number two. Why do you remember number two? She says, because I knew it was him the minute he walked out on stage. But I knew how absolutely positive I had to be because this was very important. So that's why I walked up on stage to take a closer look. And if it keep, I'll go testify if it means keeping him locked up so he can't hurt any other little kids like he hurt me. I got teary-eyed. I said, "Excuse me." I got up and I walked out. And I it was a it was it was really tough on me. I love I have a soft spot for children. And a few seconds after me, my partner Frank Salerno he came walking out. And we met in the kitchen. About a minute later, here comes the district attorney Phil Halpin, and he said. Fellas, what do you say we drop the case, the kitty cases? We don't need them. We've got the murders. No need to put the children or their families through this. And I said, amen. Let's just drop them. I mean, there's only so many. It was to keep them and prosecute them would serve only so that we could let the public know what an animal this guy really was. But there was no need to at the hands of suffering the children. So we dropped the kitty cases that day. and never went back. To this day, uh, I'm very good friends with that little young girl. And uh, she is married, children, both are very happily married, great jobs, everything's going well for them. She's a great lady. Love her. Wow, that's 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 a tough story to hear. And, and it, just hearing that, it's just kind of like, imagine all that trauma and stuff, it even hits me in... in, in you know, in my emotions. Um, one thing I heard about Richard Ramirez was that he was a very smelly guy. Was was that true? Was he? No, he, he 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 wasn't smelly. When we interviewed him, you know, the day after the day of his arrest, uh, he didn't smell. 
I didn't get close enough to kiss him to see what his breath really was <laughs> like. Yeah. Uh, surviving victims told us that he had a pungent odor to him. Yeah, that's what But I then heard. he's wearing the same clothes. Just imagine you, uh, if you go into the boys' gym, you know, the locker after the boys have had football practice, and all they do is they get their gym clothes and they stuff them in a locker. Well, pretty soon that, lo- that locker gets musky. When you get those clothes out, by the end, they're musky. They're, they, they smell terrible. Well, he was wearing the same clothes, same clothes. We called it a killer outfit, you know, it's killer clothes. And they were dark clothing, black members only type jacket. And so his shoes, his pants, or everything was black. Well, they're full of blood and they dry and he wasn't washing them, you know, so he'd put them on to go out and kill. So anybody that came in contact with him, surviving victims, he stunk. Yeah. He had brown stained gap teeth. He may have had bad breath which tells me he may have had a taco or two beforehand or he never brushed his teeth. I don't know. Hey, don't blame it on the tacos. <laughs> no, no, on the tacos. It's so never he, the taco's fault. <laughs> and, you know, he had disheveled hair. Well, he wasn't washing his hair. He wasn't the cleanest guy in the world. But he didn't stink, you know, and I get that question asked all the time. You know, was he, did he really smell? And some people said he smelled like a goat or something. Else. I, no, he didn't. He was just human. So, 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 which, which brings me to a different question. Even though, like, he, he stunk and he, you know, didn't, what, he looked the way he looked, right? He started getting, like, groupies that were, like, into him. Oh, he got a lot of groupies. He had hundreds and hundreds of followers. People, girls sending him pictures. He had some good-looking ladies going and visit right there in the courtroom just to be part of what was going on. He, he had, like, his own fan base. Uh. Personal opinion only. Personal opinion. Don't hold it against me. He ended up marrying uh, a gal named Doreen. And if it were my opinion, she's the ugliest one of the whole lot that he could have had, you know. That, uh, but she ended up getting married to him. And what makes him do that? Talk to the doctor, not me. I have no idea why they did it. So, like, knowing the fact that there's a guy that not only killed and raped people. But here they are, here she was willing to marry this guy. Yeah, and she did. You know, there was and one one day I'll never forget we're in we're in trial. And every time Richard walked in, he'd walk in the side door, he'd walk across, and he's walking in, he'd scan the audience to see pick out the good looking women in there before he got to his chair, he'd sit down because he's not allowed to turn around. Now when we'd recess, he'd get up and start walking out and he'd focus in on the the one that he had already spotted as being the best looking ones there. Well, just before we broke for recess, I get called over by the bailiff that I had a phone call. So I went over there to take the phone call. And while I'm taking the phone call, there were these two very attractive ladies. No doubt in my mind, they were attorneys. They had their little briefcases with them. They were dressed to the tent. Nice looking ladies. And as Richard came walking out, because we broke for recess, Richard looked right at him, focused on one. She was sitting on the aisle. And as soon as he walked by, she spread her legs open and blew him a kiss. And I just said, got to go, hung up, went back and told my partner. I said, that's all you got to do. She said, hook me up. Let me see if it works for me too. You know, I, But th- these ladies were she was blowing him a kiss, and why? Whether she's teasing him, having fun, I have no idea. But he did have groupies every day. That's crazy. But since he got married, I mean, like, did he ha- did he have conjugal visits, or how no. does that work? No, so- no, he never got to consummate his marriage. Okay. Matter of fact, that's when he had told uh, the. There's a guy named wrote a book by the name of Phil Halpin, who's since deceased. Uh, he passed away several years ago from Lou Gehrig's disease. And he told me that, uh, Richard told me that we, he was good for at least four more murders in L.A. County that we were not aware of. And he'd be willing to tell me all about it, but he needed about six, seven years up in the joint, and then he'll go ahead and talk to me about him. Well, we lo- actually looked, without him knowing, we had actually looked at about eight to ten other murders. Uh, but there wasn't enough evidence to positively make him on him. So we didn't want to charge him with anything under circumstantial evidence only. So we just let him remain unsolved. We didn't uh, 
pin them on Richard. Several years later, I get contacted by the author of the book, who was the best man at his wedding, and uh, ultimately, and he says, hey, Richard, ready to talk to you. Let's talk to you. And I just said, well, tell him if he's ready to talk straight shit, not bullshit, you know, go up there. Because to go up there and visit him would be like a trip to Disneyland for him. You know, he's in one man's cell on death row, so this is a big time visit for him. And then they decided to get married. News media contacted me and I told them I thought it was, uh, it was, he wasn't in jail, he wasn't in prison for rehabilitation. He was in there for punishment and he was sentenced to death. Why did the state of California owe him? It was a mockery of the criminal justice system, I thought. And it was also a mockery of the sacrament of marriage because he was never going to be able to, con there was not going to be any consummation of his marriage. And uh, so, word got back to Richard and he sees the news and so he no longer wanted to talk to me. He was pissed off. Oh, so that's, that's why so, he ended the communication. Yeah. Because so, you, you spoke freely and he didn't appreciate it. Yeah, he okay. didn't like it, so he didn't want to talk. I don't, you know, it, it, I, I wish I could have talked to him again just to gain more knowledge, but it didn't happen. I can't change it. Hands time. Yeah, so you bring some uh, some very good topics, and, and one of them um, is uh, that, that, that I wanted to ask you is why does it take so long when someone that's, that's put on that row, that row, you know, to actually be uh, put away by the, by the state? Well, what, what you have to understand is when anybody is sentenced to death, along with the death penalty goes an automatic appeal. So it's the appeals process that takes so long. And you appeal first to the local courts, and then he, his appeal was denied. And it takes time. There's so many people that are appealing. It takes time to get those appeal up. And then it goes to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says no, grant. So then the defense has a right to more appeals. And it takes probably from beginning to end 25, 30 years before they'll firmly deny or grant his appeal. So I, I imagine that if there was a, a form to expedite that process, then they would be executing uh, people a lot quicker? Well, in any other state, yes. But in the state of California with Governor Newsom, when he took over, these are the obstacles that the people of the state of California have to realize to take place. The people of the state of California voted for the death penalty. They wanted it. They wanted it. Governor Newsom took over, and he says, I know what you wanted, but as I'm governor, nobody will die. So what you want is irrelevant. I have a conscience, so I will. nobody will die while he's governor. So it depends politically which way the way the wind is blowing. I, th I think you're right. It, it has a lot to do with that, and, and uh, it's sad because um, I could only say what I've heard through other people and their opinions, right? And I, I kind of feel the same way about it too. And and keep in mind that these are just opinions, you know, it's, and people are, are, are open to express those opinions. There's no right or wrong. But a lot of people have expressed that the sooner would be better to um, take away from these people to further, uh, you know, committing crimes within prison, hurting other people, and to alleviate uh, all the costs involved in, that the taxpayers have to pay. I look at it uh, merely as I do my job, get him up there. What happens after I'm done with him, I can't worry about it. I voted for the death penalty. I, and, you know, I remember uh, during the trial uh, here in Los Angeles, I was coming back from lunch into the courtroom, and we used to have uh, high schools take field trips, the college students go into the courtroom. And so the judge, Judge Michael Tynan, is standing in front of this group of kids. And he says, here comes one of the investigators now. He says, Gil, what is your opinion on the death penalty? And I looked at him like, why are you asking me that question? <laughs> you're the judge. You're the trial judge. And I just said, are you serious? He said, yes. I said, okay, well, 
Uh, number one, I'm glad I'm not the execution, executioner. I said, but number two, the death penalty doesn't deter, is not a deterrent from anybody to commit crime uh, because murder or somebody else commit murder, it's an irrational act followed by acts of rationality. You know, you're not supposed to do that. And then, oh, I did it. Now I got to get away with it. And so you're, you're rational again. I said, so the only thing the death penalty does, it guarantees me that once he's executed or she's executed, he won't be able to harm anybody any, anymore at all. So for that, I, I could live with it. I, you know, I, I just try not to think about what's going on after I get him up there. So Richard Ramirez not only did committed crimes here in, in uh, Los Angeles, Monterey Park and all that, but he also committed some crimes way up north, like in San Francisco, right? Yes. Why was he traveling so much? Did you ever ask him what was the reason? He had friends up in San Francisco. He, he had some friends up in San Francisco, and that's why he'd go up there and visit them while he was up there. Well, since I'm here, may as well do something, and he did, he did stuff up there as well. And why he did the things he did and the way he did it, the manner he did it, he asked me at one time, why do you think I'm like this? Why do you think I did the things I, I, I do? And I said, Rich, if I knew that, I'd be a doctor making a lot more money than I am as a cop. I don't know. I don't care. My job is to gather the facts, to get everything ready for prosecution, get you successfully prosecuted, and that we're going to do. So he himself didn't understand why he did certain well, things. He he's did. asking. He doesn't know. So it's just something within him that, wow, sure. that's crazy. Um, was he a true Satanist, or that's just something like after he stopped doing his, his drugs? and He got into Satanism. He, once he was into drugs, he met some people. And he felt that under the influence of uh, drugs, these people that he started hanging with, the booty got better. And I meant the booty, not the your booty, but the stuff he was stealing. The loot. And uh, he felt that Satan gave him power. He started believing in Satan. Matter of fact, uh, he, drew, he drew a pentagram on one lady's leg. He drew a pentagram on a wall. Um, made some victims say, you know, don't swear to God, swear to Satan. And one of the interviews, I was interviewing him, he's sitting at a table and he's making a circle on a regular tabletop. And I looked at him, I'm looking at him right in the eye, and I said, go ahead and fill it in. He said, fill it in. He said, fill it in with what? I said, fill in the pentagram. That's what you're doing. You're getting ready to fill it in. Go ahead. That shit doesn't bother me. And he says, you know about that stuff? I said, yeah, I do. And he, and he erased his imaginary pentagram. And one of our survivors, matter of fact, Anastasia, a uh, little six-year-old, she said he had something on his arm and it looked like an Indian headdress. She was drawing it as a kid. It was a pentagram. He used to draw the pentagram on his arm every time he went out. Oh, wow. And when I told him in the end, after, we're, after he's convicted, I said, come on, Rich, why don't you give us the answer to this one? I said, it'll help us work other cases for future. And he says, no, Gil, I can't do that. He says, if I do that, Lucifer will kick my ass when I get to hell. He said, nope, can't tell you that. So there's pretty much no doubt in anyone's mind where he ended up, man. And yeah, but you know, you know, everybody's worried about this satanic worship. Satanism is nothing more than another form of religion. I mean, you have some people around this world that believe in a sacred cow. You have some people that believe in Buddha. You have Christians believing in a god and having faith in God. and Faith is believing in something that objectively reality says shouldn't be. So nobody's religion is wrong. You know, they're doing what they feel they have to do. Yeah, I think you're right um, the, the, by saying that no one's religion is, like, wrong, right? But I think the reason why people identify with, uh, you know, like, um, you know, like the, the the battle of good and evil kind of, sure. right? So it's kind of like, it, it's so when we hear somebody that, like, would choose that side of religion uh, most people would categorize it as being like bad or evil right so it, it it's crazy um the one that kind of like got to me while i was watching your docu the, the docuseries is it docu series or the documentary? It's a documentary i don't okay. know what they call it it's okay television it was when he got pulled over and he did the pentagram on the car on the car and then he he took off and i was like wow so he felt he felt the pentagram gave him power that that he did and, and i get asked a lot I was afraid the first time I went in there, knowing that he was into Satanism, and I'm going into a room just about the size of this room we're in right now, and were you afraid? And I said, absolutely not. You know, the guy's nothing more than human. 
That's all he was. Just another human. So, because you you were involved in uh, about how many cases? I think was it four hundred cases? Well, I've personally over four hundred murders, but I went back as a lieutenant. My last five years, I was a supervising lieutenant. I had fourteen investigators working for me. My name goes attached to every case I rolled out on, whether you know because I assisted. I didn't handle it, but I was an assist on it. So when you add up every case that my name's on and somebody's report, it'll probably be between six and eight hundred cases. Wow. So dealing with Richard after you 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 met with him so many times, he was just a regular person that did some really crazy and horrible acts on on people. I yeah. guess. That's just just, just another just a, murder. Just another way of looking at it. So, and it, it, it didn't, I put no more effort into that case than I would a transient. Matter of fact, the next case I got after we finished the trial was a, a transient. Wow. How did the Night Stalker case change your life? Oh, it, uh, it, it, I got a lot more respect after the Night Stalker case. Uh, and today it's, paid off not only in respect, appreciation, but uh, recognition. You know, the department never gave us, there were people that, you know, patrol guys that took some evidence out of the crime lab, code three, you know, with red lights and siren for us, and other people that had little parts that got recognized by the county and they gave them awards and everything. Uh, we never got, my partner and myself never got anything from the county, never got a thank you from anybody higher than my captain. You know, and, and so it was just because we worked sheriff's homicide, we didn't do anything special. We just did what was expected of us and what we expected of ourselves. So it, it's the whole thing has changed my life, my kids, everything, um, hopefully for the good. So now, now that you're retired, what's life like now for you? Yeah. I love being retired. I love being able to do what I want to do whenever I want to do it. I love being able to say whatever I want to say without having any repercussions from the department for using profanities because this mouth is can get some nasty stuff coming out of it. And uh, it, it's been good. I've been almost as busy now as I was when I was working, doing podcasts, Zooms all over the place, lecturing all over the U.S. I think last year I was in... Uh, Chicago, Miami, Seattle, Las Vegas, San Diego, Arizona, Carlsbad, uh, just traveling around speaking. So like in a weird way, even though you're retired, you really never stop working. You never really stop giving back to the community, interacting with oh, people. You have it, to. It, and and it, it, it's, it's amazing. I mean. I'm trying to work something out right now. I got a message from a kid. Uh, I shouldn't call him a kid. From a young man. Going to Bakersfield College. Bakersfield is about a three-hour drive. Asking me if there's any way that I could take the time to go be a guest speaker at his college. And I had to explain to the young man that I'd love to. I really would. I, and I told the wife this morning, I said, i got to figure out a way to get up there. I want to go up there because some Latino kid, not because he's Latino, but this primarily Latino community, and this is a Latino kid, is asking for me to go up there because I'm their hero. And I explained to him, as much as I'd love to, that's a three-hour drive for an old man. And if I go, I got to stay in a hotel, you know, two nights. One, the night that I get there before I speak, and then after I speak, I'm not going to want to drive all the way home. Uh, I said, and then I'm taking away from my family. Yeah. You know, and I got to pay for gas. So you talk to your professor. Colleges have money for speakers. You tell your professor to get in touch with me, and if they can find a little money to pay for my accommodations and a minuscule speaker's fee, just so I'm not having – I love doing this, but I don't want to put money out of my pocket, take it away from my family to go do it. Yeah. So uh, anytime I can give back, the community, I will. I've spoken, I've lectured at colleges, UCLA, USC, uh, to elementary schools, speaking to kindergartners, reading bilingual books. It doesn't matter. If I can give back to uh, the kids like 
life will give back to me, I will. So, Gil, like, um, everyone knows who you are now. Everybody, um, even w with whether they realize it or not, what what you contributed to everybody. But how would you want to be remembered? As a man of integrity. Just a man that didn't lie. You know, go, go down as a man of integrity. All I ever wanted to do was leave a legacy for my grandchildren. Uh, they've now got that. You know, this documentary that went out, they've never seen it because they're 6 and 11. My daughter doesn't want them to see it yet. But they'll see it. But they've seen me on TV on other shows and stuff. And it made me laugh. A couple of weeks ago, my 6-year-old was with my wife. They were at the market. And when she's checking out, he says, Hey, Nana. Did you tell the lady that Papa's a famous guy? Yeah, so uh, it, it just changed. And they've been with me when people have come up and just want to take a photograph, say thank you, or ask for an autograph. Uh, it's all appreciated, you know, and I don't, uh, I don't deter anybody from, from doing it. Some people are embarrassed, you know, come here, just come say hi. I'm no different. I am no better than anybody out on those streets. I'm just, as they'd say, I'm just empty. You know, I'm just an ordinary, average guy. Oh, that's awesome. Um, well, I, I want to thank you for your time. I th I value time tremendously. Uh, I think that the number one thing you can give somebody is your time. And I, I want to thank you for giving me your time and being on, on the best podcast in Long Beach, California. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. And thank you for the invitation. Thank you for having me on your show. Say hello to everybody out, out in uh, a, a, uh, what's, uh, AT, what's called uh, All Things Comedy. All Things Comedy. Say hello ATC. to George for us. Um, enjoy your tapatio nuts and everything. And we hope to have you sometime back on the show whenever I, whenever I, you want. Whenever I, I'd love to come back and just tell a little later I said Kyobo. <laughs> I'll let him know. Maybe he'll invite you to one of his comedy shows. All right. Sounds good. All right. Thank you so much, Gil. All right. And with that said, guys, we'll catch you guys next time.